Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James, and uh, I'm a user experience designer, which means for the last 15 or so years, in order to build the next generation of digital products, I've had to sit at that intersection of emerging technology and human behavior. And as I've done this kind of work, something has recently come top of mind for me. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. I'm actually here with a call to action. I want every single one of you to become a better connoisseur of technology in your own life. Now, I know some people bristle at the word connoisseur. It's got this highbrow connotation. I'm not here to tell you to be eye snobs. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm here because I believe it's a moral imperative. But we'll get to that in a second. First, I want to define what it means to be a connoisseur. <laughs> so <laughs> to become a connoisseur is to become an expert judge in matters of taste, right? And we, this makes sense to us. We think of connoisseurs of art, maybe music, maybe food, right? And we live in the best town for this, right? We have our cult of craft beer. We have our read your own damn book clubs. We, <laughs> we even have a Kickstarter backed cheese club, which is phenomenal. This is a great town for it, right? And recently, I feel like I, I've stumbled upon a den of connoisseurs here in Portland. For those of you who haven't been here, this is the Multnomah Whiskey Library. It's amazing. Um, it's beautiful. It's like stepping back into another time. And when you look along the walls, you see these amazing gilded shelves. And atop these gilded shelves are thousands upon thousands of bottles of whiskey, quite literally. And there is nothing like going into the library for me to realize that I am not, in fact, a connoisseur of whiskey. Um, I was a little bit clueless, but I am a student of human behavior. So I was able to observe these connoisseurs in their native habitat. And they were able to make these great decisions, right? Like, I like bourbon over scotch, or I prefer peat flavors over, over smoke, right? Whatever was um, important to them, the values that made choices easy for them. And I think this is the crux of being a connoisseur. It's being able to make smart, informed choices based on your own values. Now, this wall of choice reminded me of another wall that I had seen. Um, this is Apple's app wall at their Worldwide Developers Conference, and every single of those tiny little squares represents an app on the App Store. Choice is available to us in, te in technology. Now, I don't know how much you guys spend thinking about this, but uh, as a designer, I'm acutely aware of this, because in fact, my job is the applied science of making this complexity clear it's about dipping into that sea of data that's available to us and making meaning. And as designers, we actually do this by trying to understand the people we're designing for, what matters to them. And that's how you sort of elevate something beyond just utility to create a spark of human emotion to make something more meaningful, more valuable, right? Um, it's my job. I absolutely love it. But let me give you a really concrete example of this. So weather apps. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of weather apps on the App Store. And they have a pretty standard data set, right? You've got high and low temperature, precipitation, all that standard stuff, right? Um, and on the left here, we've got something called dark skies. Now, dark skies takes where you are in that moment, the forecast, and it gives you really actionable data. It says it's going to start dr to drizzle in 35 minutes. And if you're a biker in Portland, this is a very handy thing to have, right? Um, on the other hand, we have Yahoo's weather app. And they take the same data, right? They say, where are you? What's the forecast? And they find a picture on the internet that combines those two things to evoke an emotion about weather. Both amazing experiences, very well designed, but appeal to very different types of people. So let's talk about another choice in technology. For the like four of you, in the audience who have not played this game. It's called Candy Crush Saga. And uh, it's amazing. They have something like 150 million monthly active users. It's one of the most downloaded and played games the last six months or so. And uh, it's, it's essentially a, a puzzle game. 
And anyone who has played this can tell you that if you get hooked, if you play long enough to get hooked, you cannot put the darn game down. Now, this has a really interesting side effect, because if you look at the reviews in the App Store, you see people talking about the fact that it's mind-numbing and addictive. Think about those words for a second. Now, because we're talking about choice, I'll show you my local favorite. This is built here in Portland by a guy named Nevin Morgan. It's called Black Bar. And it, too, is a puzzle game, but it uses words. And uh, if you look at the, the App Store reviews, you see people talking about it being thought-provoking and witty. Now, this is about choice. I believe Candy Crush is really well-named. It's digital junk food. But I like a bag of Doritos, too, right? If you actually need an escape, Candy Crush can be amazing. But what I do want to emphasize it if, is if your technology choices are actually making you feel bad about yourself, perhaps you should reconsider, right? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you this because technology is changing our behaviors. Technology is a part of our culture. A decade ago, you would not have seen people in a bar taking a picture of a cocktail to post on Instagram. By the way, I heard a rumor that we totally took down Instagram earlier this morning. Um, but this is, this is interesting, right? Because people are using technology in new and interesting ways, and it's changing our world in the bar room, in the boardroom, in the bedroom, and yes, admit it, even in your bathroom, right? Technology is coming into our lives and new and interesting ways. And I believe that we need to be more thoughtful about our choices as this happens. And I think this is important, actually, because of our kids. This kind of reminds me of the last talk, actually. Our kids, they're so important to us, right? Um, and I want you to think about the last time that you handed a child in your life some kind of technology. Now, I don't care what your relationship to that particular child was, and I don't care if it was a smartphone or an Xbox controller, but what were you thinking about in that moment that you handed this to them? Were you thinking about you, the fact you needed five more minutes to get the dishes done or finish a conversation with your spouse? Were you thinking about the impact that this technology might have on this kid's life, good, bad, or otherwise? These are the questions that actually do kind of keep me up at night, because this is not any kid. This is my eight-year-old son, Travis. We have jokingly, for quite some time, called him the kid bot, um, because he perhaps does not have a normal mom when it comes to technology, because of what I do. This just happened to be the number of devices sitting in my house on an average Saturday morning. Um, but because we have so much technology, I worry a lot how, how this technology is going to impact his life. And the more I talk to other parents and educators, I know that I'm not the only one who has these concerns. And the reason that we worry is because sometimes scary things happen. Let me give you a really great example that happened in my house. So my kid, he's eight years old, he loves cartoons. And one of his favorites is this great cartoon called Dexter's Laboratory. And it's about a kid scientist, right? Totally awesome cartoon. Now, my son couldn't remember if we had been watching this on Netflix or on iTunes. So he pops open iTunes, and he types in D-E-X. And what do you think happens? Yeah. <laughs> Showtime's favorite serial killer, Dexter, comes up. Now, the social scientist in me thought, Ooh, that's really interesting. But the mother part of me was mortified. I was horrified that my kid was looking at Dexter. And this is what happens if we're not thinking critically about the technologies that we're handing to our kids or we don't understand them. Perhaps we're sending our children down a dark hallway alone where Dexter is waiting <laughs> just around the corner. Now, I believe this is happening because we view our children as digital natives. This is actually what the media calls them. Um, but a cultural anthropologist uh, who studies a lot in this, Dana Boyd, she actually calls them digital naives. You sort of drop that T out. And this is because um, while the technology seems natural in the hands of our kids, 
oftentimes we're ceding parental responsibility to them before they're mature enough because they're viewed as being ready to just sort of take this on. And by the way, this happened, this has happened forever. For my generation, we were responsible for programming the VCRs of the world. You too, right? Um, but there's, but the, the stakes were lower then, right? The problem we have is if we're doing this today, if we're waiting for our kids to tell us about the funny new video on YouTube or the great new app, if it's Snapchat or WhatsApp, I think there's a risk inherent in this. Um, and I think this is all evidence that we are a generation who is becoming increasingly digitally illiterate at the exact same time that we're trying to raise our kids to be good digital citizens. And this is important in almost every aspect of their life, from school to work to home and social life. Now, I think this is really important and I've heard it said that talking to our kids about digital citizenry is essentially the new version of the birds and the bees talk. It makes us really, really uncomfortable, but it's necessary because in this age of data permanence, mistakes that our kids make, if they make them online, will be worn on their digital identity like a tattoo. And we cannot afford to walk into these conversations with our children ill-prepared. Now, this reminds me of a quote uh, from one of my favorite authors, Douglas Adams, and he came up with a set of rules about our reactions to technologies. And he said, any technology introduced into the world after you're the age of 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> And I thought this was funny until the very moment I put on Google Glass. Yes, this was this moment. And I was not a connoisseur in this moment. I was not thinking critically. I had this visceral, negative reaction. And the problem with this is if we want to be good role models to our kids, we need to model the behaviors and the attitudes that we want to see in them. We want them to be curious. We want them to be joyful. We don't want them to make this face. Um, so I'm here to tell you that I actually think there's a simple solution to this. And I like to call it James Keller's three-step model for becoming a better digital connoisseur in your own life. Step one, very simply, is to question. Find a question. Step two is to play. I love that that was a theme of one of the last talks. You need to experiment, you need to explore. And step three is to learn. And by the way, if you use this model well, on that step three, when you learn, it's actually gonna provoke more and interesting questions, and this should be a virtuous circle. So let's th break this down for everybody. So step one, the question. Now, for me, the question was, Google Glass, does it matter? Um, and that might not be the question for everybody. Uh, the question for you might actually be, what app, weather app is right for me? Or even, which is my favorite of the top 10 videos on YouTube right now? All of those very good questions. Step two. Step two is to play, to explore, to experiment, to roll up your sleeves, invest the time, and do whatever is necessary to figure this out which means that you too can discover why true facts about the octopus is one of the funniest things on YouTube right now. I love it. Um, and then step three. Step three is to learn. It's to think critically. It's to say if and how and why these technologies matter to our world, if and how and why they align to your values, and if and how and why you want to integrate these technologies into your own life. And by the way, the best way to learn is to teach. And this is the moment that we bring our children back into that conversation because we can tell them about what we've found, what we've experienced, and what's important to us so that we can ask them what they see, what they've found, and what's important to them. Because, by the way, our kids are going to be building the technology platforms of our future. And we want to equip them to be able to think critically because their creations are going to impact the world that we live in.
Thank you.